Okay, I, I welcome you to the last session of uh, this uh, extended symposium today. Uh, we're in the company of very distinguished uh, scholars and historians of science. Uh, and the biographies are in your hands, so I, I'll keep ceremony to a minimum and just simply mention their names and affiliations and we'll get started just so as to spend as much time on substance. Uh, the, f the first speaker is Stephen Shapen from uh, ha Harvard University, historian of science. Uh, he'll be followed by James Glick, who's uh, a, a science writer whose who's, uh, uh, works have been widely read and admired recently. And uh, the commentator is Professor Mawa El Sharki of our own history department. Uh, so I'll ask Stephen uh, Shapen to speak first on the science of subjectivity. In, in the science studies world, we've been fascinated um, for some time by objectivity. We've stopped taking it for granted. We've displayed its historicity, its contingency, its shifting meanings. We've described the practices of securing the appearance of objectivity, and we've described those practices not as the application of off-the-shelf method, but as hard political and cultural work. So we've pricked the objectivity balloon. Objectivity, we say, is an ideal for science, and some of us, whether it's actually a coherent and stable ideal, but it's not a reality about science, not in a form easily recognizable from its ideals. And science has been seen as, traditionally, as the major, if not the only, domain where objectivity lives. We've brought the idea of objectivity into alignment with reality, ironically, to make it more objective, by adding to it doses of subjectivity. We historicize objectivity by drawing attention to what's counted as objectivity at various times and places. We take supposedly objective claims, beliefs, practices, stipulations, and we show their impurity, the presence in them of all sorts of subjective things. That which seems to be transparently about objects in the world contains ineradicable elements belonging to subjects, their categories, customs, conventions, and purposes. Our scientific knowledge is about the world, and it's also irremediably about us as knowers. And the condition of our knowledge being intelligibly about the world is that it contains a bit of us. I take that to be lesson number one of the sociology of scientific knowledge. Giving accounts of whatever is counted as objectivity, we have sometimes without noticing it, made subjectivity into a matter of potential interest. Subjectivity has indeed been a scholarly focus, but typically in philosophical, historical, and ethnographic treatments of the subject and changes in the attributed makeup of that subject, what is and what is thought about the entity that experiences, feels, acts, acts with, is acted upon. That literature is important and it's extensive, but scholars haven't written so much or so incisively when subjectivity and objectivity are considered with respect to making knowledge. Here the categories of the objective and the subjective are arrayed in opposition, both in description and in evaluation. Subjectivity is then called upon to deflate objectivity. The two notions go together, but as doppelganger, the good child and its evil twin, where the one is the positive image, the other the negative, a trickster figure, making a mess out of everything. Subjectivity is then seen as a philosophical trouble. It's what pollutes objective knowledge. You can find subjectivity as an item in philosophy encyclopedias, but more usually it's encompassed within the entry on objectivity, the grit in the knowledge machine. Look up subjectivity in the index of Rorty's philosophy in the mirror of nature, and you refer to an entry for the objective-subjective distinction. Their works in science studies and the philosophy of science, in which subjectivity features in the title and then goes practically invisible in the text, which shows little to no focus concern with what subjectivity is, 
or how it might work in making knowledge. A doppelganger conception of objectivity and subjectivity is classical. Aristotle and the Stoics circulated the image of the two standing epistemically in the same relation as the wax to the seal. The image worked for Descartes and Locke in the 17th century, and more recently it served for Rainey Dasson and Peter Gallison in their um, historical survey of objectivity. Objectivity is a candidate for membership in jail or Austin's class of trouser words, taking their meaning from the words to which they're customarily opposed, where the negative and now strange language wears the trousers. You might think, if we believe this, that a subjectivity would be as much a topic of focused theoretical and empirical inquiry as its twin. We'd be greatly interested in what it is. We'd want to distinguish its specific forms and modes. We'd be interested in how it figures in concrete knowledge-making practices. But in science studies, we've done almost none of those things, and that's odd. Since if we no longer believe in the objectivity of legend, that puts quite a load on the subject of items that we use to deflate. Oddly, it seems that objectivity doesn't exist, but subjectivity does. There are probably two reasons for this general neglect. One is the strength of the identification of scientific knowledge with ideas of objectivity and the intellectual capital that accrues from deflating what we take as legend. The other is what might be called the dustbin conception of subjectivity, the bin that holds the heterogeneous bits and pieces of whatever it is that makes trouble for objectivity stories. We take objectivity as an ideal to be historicized, and subjectivity is what we're sadly stuck with if we don't watch out. The idea that there's nothing coherently and stably to be said about the subjective element in knowledge making, that it's inchoate, arbitrary, unstable, and endlessly varying, fits subjectivity for its supposedly contaminating task and also excuses us from making its workings an explicitly framed topic of inquiry. What could we possibly find out? That sentiment, too, is classical. Subjectivities, like the practices of making the knowledge is called objective, have their modes. And the naturalistic impulse rightly considers them in their specificities, that is, from the grab bag of capacities and cultural practices widely regarded as subjective and as yielding subjective claims and knowledge, we can describe concrete forms, just as it's been proven useful to describe the specific modes of knowledge making known as solid state physics or botanical taxonomy rather than an entity like science as a whole. So let's consider one mode of subjectivity among very many, the one called taste. Here the famous Latin tag is de gustibus non est disputandum. No one seems to know where the phrase originated, though some think it must be scholastic. Common English renderings are there's no disputing about taste, there's no arguing about taste, and there's no accounting for taste. To each his own, you like Wagner and I like Verdi, and there's nothing we can say to each other that would either alter our opinions or reliably communicate one to the other what is good about Wagner to the Verdi person or vice versa. It's widely thought that neither the facts of the matter nor rational persuasion can conceivably have any place in such things in its normative sense, de gustibus counts as advice, good advice. Don't argue when differing tastes present themselves in social situations, or at least don't expect that such arguments can lead to any worthwhile outcome. Arguing about taste beyond a certain point or too energetically can be a pain. It's rude, it's pointless, it's likely to be disruptive. Now, in science studies, a telling instance of that view appeared in an important 1973 essay by Thomas Kuhn in which he was concerned to defend himself from charges of subjectivism. <clears throat> Suppose, Kuhn said, he and a friend go to a movie, a Western, and afterwards he remarks to his friend, how I like that terrible pot boiler. That the movie was a pot boiler is, Kuhn writes, a matter of judgment. He and his friend can argue all night, invoking all sorts of standards and criteria about whether or not it was a pot boiler. Judgment, Kuhn says, is discussable. If you like, it can be rational. Kuhn was willing to describe it as rational. Maybe Kuhn implied he and his friend can come by trading arguments and evidence to share the view that the movie was indeed a potboiler. 
But by contrast, that he liked the film is what Kuhn called a matter of taste. The experience of liking is incorrigibly subjective, it is private, and for that reason there's nothing to be said about it that has any consequence. Kuhn, short of saying that I lied, he, his friend, cannot disagree with my report that I liked the film, that there was something good about it, or that what I said about my reaction was wrong. What is discussable in my remark is not my characterization of my internal state, my exemplification of taste, but rather my judgment that the film was a pot boy, or that's Kuhn. Where taste is concerned, there's just nothing to be discussed. Kuhn defended his work in the philosophy and history of science by saying that, of course, scientific theory choice is a matter of judgment, but it's not a matter of taste, about which he claims you cannot discuss, <coughs> cannot find criteria, cannot advance evidence, cannot go on in a rational way, cannot reach any sort of agreement, cannot account for differing outcomes. Kuhn here implicitly assimilated positions in the philosophy of science to a body of thought rarely considered in connection with science. The taste-judgment distinction has traditionally had its being in aesthetics, especially in the 18th century efflorescence of concern with the beautiful and the good. And though Kuhn didn't say so, thinking of scientific and aesthetic judgments in the same frame is quite a productive thing to do. He actually learned this through his conversations with his friend Stanley Cavell, who were both teaching at, uh, at Berkeley at the time. Uh, so if it's not exactly Keats's truth is beauty, beauty, truth, at least it's that properly understood concrete procedures for rendering truth and beauty judgments resemble each other quite a lot, or at least that's my claim. I briefly want to say how they do, and along the way I want to suggest how we might get interested in some historical and contemporary practices of subjectivity and knowledge making as forms of science, how they belong within the same uh, frame. Now I say practices of subjectivity since the, notional, the notion again becomes accessible in its uh, specifics. Taste is one of many practices of subjectivity and the specific modes of taste involved in the organoleptic properties of aliment, notably taste and odor, have been widely accounted amongst the most private, arbitrary, and least discussable of all subjective modes. So how did 18th century aesthetic philosophers think about taste judgments? There were writers in a direct genealogical line with Kuhn's distinction, Thomas Reed, for example, surveyed existing philosophical opinion about the relationship between the categories of judgment and taste. Philosophers had situated the domain of judgment in means and deliberations, but reckoned judgment impotent in deciding between ends or in fixing upon what was good. Here they thought, this is Reed, we must be guided not by judgment, but by some natural or acquired taste which makes us relish one thing and dislike another, a taste we could not discuss. Reed's examples were a food choice and a moral choice, and he was concerned with the question of whether both could be viewed within the same frame. He said, if one man prefers cheese to lobsters, another lobsters to cheese, it's vain to apply judgment to determine which is right. Now, a different genealogy stems from David Hume's great essay concerning the standard of taste. And here its development would lead to an understanding of taste different from the one that Kuhn commended. Hume's question was whether there could be such a thing as a standard in matters of taste. And the first response he canvassed was no. He invoked De Gustibus, and he talked about taste in the same sort of way that Kuhn later did. To seek the real beauty, this is Hume, or real deformity is as fruitless an inquiry as to pretend to ascertain the real sweet or the real bitter. According to the dispositions of the organs, the same object may be both sweet and bitter, and the proverb, de gustibus, has justly determined it to be fruitless to dispute concerning taste. But the richness of Hume's essay comes from not leaving the matter there. He also considered the coherence and legitimacy uh, of the view that tastes are neither arbitrary nor incapable of being shared. 
Indeed, it was a common sentiment amongst 18th century Scottish philosophers that the arbitrariness implied by de Gustibus was refuted by the everyday practices of those who articulated the proverb. Alexander Gerard, for example, perceptively noted that the proverb, de Gustibus, though frequently expressed, is never steadily or consistently adopted. Its authority is sometimes urged by persons whose sentiments are called into question, but it is disregarded by the same persons whenever they're disposed to call in question the sentiments of others. So you take de Gustibus when you can find uh, no principle or evidence to justify your taste, but when you find fault with another's taste, you believe and act as if there is a standard of taste, a right and wrong in the matter. When I say a Vermeer is beautiful, I mean it to be understood that there's something about the painting. That's the occasion of my saying so and ought to cause you to respond as I respond. I'd like it if you did. It's hard to imagine the point of my saying that Vermeer was, was beautiful if what I meant was nothing to do with observable aspects of the painting, aspects to which I can draw your attention and which I might be able to associate with more or less robust features of beautiful paintings. My sense of its beauty has of course got to do with me but it has also got to do with the painting. And in thinking that, I do not have to believe in any such notion as universal aesthetic standards. As we reckon the taste responses have got to do with objects and not just subjects, we then quite forget, Hume reminds us, this is Hume, the natural equality of tastes. And he might have said, we argue, dispute, and discuss quite a lot. It's natural for us, Hume said, to call on evidence and reasoned argument in order to arrive either at agreement or adjudication. You and I can discuss things about the painting that flow from what I notice and you may not, or the other way around. We do not then act as if we regard our judgments as arbitrary or essentially private. Insofar as we think that there are aspects of the object that elicit our aesthetic responses, we're talking about the objects. The same objects available to you as well as to me, and we can and do refer to, even point at aspects of those objects as we talk about our responses. That position, too, was staked out, turned over, and debated in 18th century aesthetics. Kant's critique of judgment named and discussed what he called the antinomy of taste. There are, he observed, two principles of judgment, each of which is valid, but each of which seems to rule out the other. On the one hand, taste is an internal private felt response, subjective in the sense that there's no way that I can feel just what you feel. And on the other hand, taste is something we might be able to give reasons for, reasons which we might communicate objective in the sense that such reasons exist and that we can attach them to the object in question. For all the points held in common, 18th century aesthetics doesn't offer a stable understanding of taste no more than the philosophy of science offers a stable picture of scientific judgment. For example, Edmund Burke on the sublime disagreed with Hume's <coughs> suggestion that what might be bitter to some is sweet to others. He, he simply rejected any such uh, idea. Nor did the aesthetic philosophers of the 18th century resolve Kant's antinomy of taste. The value for us, I think, in considering their work is that they recognized, confronted, and discussed the antinomy. They didn't conduct ethnographic research on taste formation, nor did they produce detailed historical studies of how tastes were made and how the aesthetic private becomes public to the extent they, they did. They acknowledged uh, that the sharing of taste, the rendering it social rather than individual, was a massive problem, but they reckoned the taste communities could be and were brought into being. In 20th century philosophical terminology, they were looking for the concrete means by which intersubjectivity might be secured with difficulty and under specific conditions. And I think their experiences and their precedents are, uh, are in, in, instructive. In fact, to the proverbial, there's no arguing about taste, I'd counter that we argue about little else. And that absent such arguments and discussions, we wouldn't be able to recognize the fabric of our quotidian social life. We do not much discuss or argue whether two plus two equals four, except in philosophy classrooms. 
or about the facts of the matter except in law courts. But the texture of our conversation centers precisely on whether An Affair to Remember is a good movie, whether Catch-22 is a great novel, or whether Texas Barbecue is better than Carolina Barbecue. So far as the practices of everyday life are concerned, including the everyday life of science making, we should get better at understanding judgment and how it happens. As Richard Rorty once said, if the objectivity of legend is not on the table, nevertheless, we might be interested in something that he thought served the purposes for which objectivity is commonly invoked, which is the achievement, whenever it happens, of unforced agreement, of coming to free and practical interactional assent about what is, from another point of view, private to the experiencing and knowing subject. Objectivity, he said, is intersubjectivity. So what do we know? about how taste judgments are formed and how they come to be shared? The answer is not a lot. There's usually some misunderstanding when I say that. There's a huge sociological literature about this, I'm told, but there isn't. The sociological treatment of taste has focused overwhelmingly on the social uses of taste, on taste as a social marker, as a mode of distinction, on explanations of changing taste, on fashion, as a social phenomenon, and all these are worthy topics. But they're not the same thing as a focused engagement with making and communicating taste. Antoine Aignan in Paris has described and deplored sociologists' interest in what taste does to the neglect of what taste is and how it's formed in the interactions between people and objects, people and people. Describing the tasting of wine He advocates what he calls the sociology of attention, an appreciation of tasters' efforts momentarily to make themselves objects rather than subjects, to arrange, he says, a stronger presence of the tasted object, to attend to and respond to what the tasted object reveals, what it is saying. What would be good to have are ethnographies, contemporary and historical, of how taste judgments come to be formed, discussed, and sometimes shared. Such ethnographies, I think, would look a lot like the lab ethnographies produced in science studies. Now, one reason I suspect that we have so few examples of this sort of thing is the sway of the degustibus sensibility. Either there it's thought there's no possibility of discussing taste, there's no point in any such discussion. But there is both the possibility and the point, and there exist, in fact, a handful of examples showing varying degrees of interest in how, on a concrete level and in a quotidian frame, taste happens. A noteworthy example is a study of how one becomes an opera buff, recently published by the sociologist Claudio Benzecri. How do you learn to respond to opera the way that opera lovers do, to be an opera lover? You hang out with opera lovers, you observe the moments and circumstances that elicit approving and disapproving responses, You note the words, phrases, and gestures attached to descriptions and evaluations of opera passages and performances. As you listen to the opera, so you listen to the associations and distinctions made between different performances, and you get better at becoming an opera lover as you see more operas and sometimes uh, notice the reactions to your descriptions and evaluations. Becoming an opera lover is knowing about opera and knowing about opera lovers and knowing about how opera lovers know about opera and how they know about other opera lovers. It's about the external world and it's about coordinating and distinguishing one's private aesthetic responses with the private aesthetic responses of others. Benzekri acknowledged inspiration by the early work of the sociologist Howard Becker about how you learn to be a marijuana user Indeed, how you learn to experience what a marijuana user experiences and how to value and talk about those experiences. You need both cannabis and community, both objects in the world and fellow experiencing subjects. Everybody gets stoned alone, together. Academics haven't been greatly interested in naturalistic understandings of the practices of taste and judgment, but there are many other sorts of people to take up the slack. And there are two kinds of communities which have more or less systematically reflected on how tastes may be formed, described, and sometimes shared. 
The community of connoisseurs and those allied to connoisseurship is one sort. The usage of the word connoisseur, by the way, evidently came into English in the context of the 18th century culture of refinement and politeness that the Scottish aesthetic philosophers were so concerned with, the man of knowledge as a man of taste. In the French from which it was borrowed, it simply meant knowing in the sense of being acquainted with on the Kennan side of the German Kennan Wissen distinction. But in English, it was attached to the special sort of knowing that was discernment in matters of taste. Connoisseurship and scientific judgment aren't usually considered together. But they should be, and indeed they were, by the physical chemist and philosopher Michael Polanyi. Judgment for Polanyi wasn't rigidly rule-governed, but neither was it arbitrary or private. And this is what he signaled by repeatedly assimilating scientific judgment to practices like knowing the characteristics and qualities of wine. Connoisseurship, Polanyi wrote, like skill, can be communicated only by example, not by precept. To become an expert wine taster, to acquire a knowledge of innumerable different blends of tea, or to be trained as a medical diagnostician, you must go through a long course of experience under the guidance of a master. Scientific beliefs are necessarily indeterminate. They are like rules of art. They're guides in the making of scientific discoveries and guides of connoisseurship in assessing the value of scientific claim. Now, Thomas Kuhn, who assimilated huge chunks of Polanyi's philosophy, largely without acknowledgment in the structure of scientific revolution, never used the word connoisseurship, but his description of scientific judgment is arguably very much the same as Polanyi's. Wine connoisseurs, for example, talk a lot about the flavor and odor characteristics of wines. Much of their talk is referential. That is, a point to characteristics in the wine which connoisseurs come to know about and taste communities can and do coalesce around more or less stable ways of designating these characteristics. You can learn to apply the descriptor black currency to a wine made from Cabernet Sauvignon or flinty to a Chablis. You can believe that you're then doing something different from what you might be doing if you said that the wine reminded you of a spring morning. And you can believe that the black currenty odor arises from a substance which is indeed present in both the wine and in the fruit. More to the point, you can come to be a member of a community using the same predicates to refer uh, to their experiences, private experience, and to the aesthetic properties of the wine. That sort of community can refer judgments of goodness to an assemblage of properties like that. There's a copyrighted device called a wine aroma wheel devised by a professor at the UC Davis Viticulture and Enology Department. It allows users, and there are evidently many thousands around the world, reliably to assign stable descriptors to wine odors and tastes proceeding from such basic categories as fruity, floral, and nutty to more finely gauged descriptors such as peach, apricot, and apple. The users are instructed to provide themselves with index samples uh, of descriptors for the asparagus odor, several drops of the brine from tinned asparagus in a neutral white wine. And the point is not taste objectivity, it's taste intersubjectivity. The aroma wheel is a homespun intersubjectivity engine. Taste communities coalesce around practices like that, practices that refer to mutually accessible external properties as the causes of private internal states. These taste communities are neither universal, nor are they easy to join but then neither are the thought communities of particle physics and genomics. The wine wheel is small beer, but many forms of modern commercial and academic taste expertise are immensely influential. Among the less visible bits of modern corporate and academic science are what I want to call the sciences of subjectivity, embedded within what I'd also like to call the aesthetic industrial complex. So uh, a brief but instructive example to conclude. During the Second World War, the US Army <coughs> Quartermaster Corps became aware that rations for the troops designed for nutritiousness weren't performing their role, 
because the men didn't like how they tasted and looked. Aesthetic responses were made into a focused topic of inquiry. That's to say, there was a practical demand here and elsewhere for objective information about subjective states. Here, the army added impetus to industrial and academic concerns with tastes that were emerging in the 1940s and 1950s as the technologies of sensory evaluation, notably in connection with the wine and food scientists of the University of California at Davis. The industrial consulting company in Cambridge, Mass., Arthur D. Little, Inc., together with the Army and commercial food and beverage companies, including Coca-Cola and Pillsbury, developed the so-called flavor profile method for eliciting and objectifying taste responses and the chillingly named hedonic index to quantify liking. These methods and their successes, often used in connection with focus group techniques pioneered by Robert Merton at Columbia, now form a vast complex of technical resources that help shape not just our elementary environment, but also practically everything that is commercially formulated, designed, and marketed, from pretzels to presidents, cabernets to Cadillacs, from apples to apples. The sciences of subjectivity are world-making. With some honorable exceptions, modern philosophers have either relegated taste to the domain of the inaccessible and the inchoate, or carried on the fight to identify universal standards. Sociologists have engaged with the functions rather than the formation of taste, and a few historians have written about olfactory reactions as indices of the civilizing process. Meanwhile, the modern sciences of subjectivity go on their way, largely unattended to by people like us. Their practitioners are unaware of the inaccessibility and arbitrariness of taste responses because they have found ways of accessing them, operationalizing their meaning, and like it or not, manipulating them, and even turning them into profit. So if there's no accounting for taste, that's news to the accountants. Thank you. Well, I have a footnote for Stephen's provocative talk concerning the question of whether Catch-22 is a good novel. There's a website called lettersofnote.com that just this week published a letter from Evelyn Waugh on the occasion of his having received advanced galleys of Catch-22 from its editors in hopes of soliciting, of, in hopes of obtaining a blurb. But Waugh didn't like Catch-22, and he wrote, this book should offend, its treat this book's treatment of the American military class should offend friends of the United States, of whom I count myself to be one, and give comfort to its enemies. But he did not say, this is a bad novel. He said, this is not a novel. From which I think we can infer that Waugh did not think his judgment about fiction was a matter of subjective taste. All right. Um, somebody in the audience just asked me what my field was. So I'm going to start by confessing that I don't have a field. Um, and well, I'm all the more grateful to you, Stathis, for inviting me to this in interesting conference. I just learned this morning for the first time the news that the humanities have reached a dead end. I'm going to aim toward a sort of simple and I hope slightly optimistic conclusion. Optimistic, that is, as opposed to melancholic and also as opposed to triumphant. Thank you, Rosie. Um, Starting from first principles, I find myself wondering, what are the inhuman sciences? And I guess conventionally we say that theoretical physics is a kind of inhuman science, and it does feel as though 
the very expensive and prestigious realm of particle physics, high energy physics is fairly inhuman. Whether or not 2012 will finally be the year they find the Higgs boson, AKA the God particle, somewhere in the 17 mile underground circular tunnel that houses the Large Hadron Collider. This is not going to shed any light on our humanity. It's not going to help us find our purpose or our place in the cosmos. Even the faster than light neutrino, exciting though it was while it lasted, never threatened to give psychologists or anthropologists anything new to think about. Still, if you ask a random human being to name the most important scientist of the last century, it's bound to be Albert Einstein. Yet, theoretical physics seldom seems to lend itself to interdisciplinary cross-fertilization. Meanwhile, there's an altogether different, newer type of science that creates its own type of divide between the human and the inhuman, and that's the one I want to talk about. There are non-humans everywhere nowadays, non-humans non being apparatuses. Computers, like these and like the ones that everyone in this room has in his or her pocket, um, links to our global prosthetic memory, creatures of computer science, which is itself a branch of knowledge that grows from the root called information theory, which began in 1948 with the mathematician and engineer Claude Shannon, who's not as famous as Einstein, but maybe should be. The first point about information theory is that there is such a thing as information. That may seem obvious now. We all say that we live in the information age, but it needed some justification in 1948. Until that year, information was something vague, like news or gossip. It was nothing for scientists to concern themselves with. After that year, it was. Information was reified, mathematicized, measured in bits, a word Shannon used in print for the first time. This was a great moment in the venerable tradition of taking everyday words and redefining them for the purposes of hard science. Famous predecessors of information being force, mass, gravity, energy. Shannon specified that information here, although related to the everyday meaning of the word, should not be confused with it. He said he wanted to leave aside the psychological factors and focus on the physical, whatever physical might mean when talking about information. The scientific reification of information had strong consequences. It was a fulcrum around which the world began to turn. The mathematical framework, soon to be called information theory, appeared in mature form in Shannon's initial 1948 paper, which had the modest title, A Mathematical Theory of Communication. It was quickly published as a book with the less modest title, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. And with 60 years of hindsight, I think we can say that it earned its definite article. Any notion that communication was automatically a human science, though, was quickly dispelled. The theory involved information sources, transmitters, signals, channels, receivers, and destinations, and none of these had to be biological. In its very first form, Shannon's framework covered coding, error correction, channel capacities, noise, and entropy, it unified two distinct realms of engineering, analog communication, where messages went via continuous waveforms, as in the telephone system, Shannon's employer, after all, was AT&T, and digital communication, where messages were strings of discrete symbols. AT&T didn't do much digital communication. I know you're waiting for me to make a joke there. Shannon mentioned that 
digital communication would have application for the theory of computing machines. This was the moment in time when people were suddenly getting the idea that computing machines could, could soon become important. And from a humanist point of view, a science that was creating them was immediately suspect. The idea of thinking machines provided grist for cover stories in news magazines. Machinery thinking struck some people as an oxymoron and others as actually unpleasant. Shannon himself, for what it's worth, was not one of those people. He said, the idea of a machine thinking is by no means repugnant to all of us. In fact, I find the converse idea that the human brain may itself be a machine which could be duplicated functionally with inanimate objects quite attractive. More useful, anyway, than hypothecating intangible and unreachable vital forces, souls, and the like. This conversation shows no signs of abating even today. At the beginning of the century, the word relativity attracted the attention of various social scientists and you know, moral philosophers who mistakenly thought there might be something in it for them. In the 1950s, the same thing happened with information, only this time, scientists in distant fields were not mistaken. Information theory did lend itself to cross-fertilization. Molecular biology was in its birth throes, and the genetic code could not have been properly understood in the 1950s and 60s without the vocabulary coming from information. A host of sciences were all coming of age, anthropology and psychology, looking for new mathematical footing, medical offshoots like neurophysiology, not quite sciences like psychoanalysis. The neuroscientist Warren McCulloch organized a series of interdisciplinary conferences downtown at the Beekman Hotel that could very well have been called Rethinking the Human Sciences. Actually, they were called the Conferences for Circular, Causal, and Feedback Mechanisms in Biological and Social Systems. For short, the Cybernetics Conferences, the word cybernetics being a tip of the hat to Norbert Wiener, who was one of the more famous participants. McCulloch's justification was very grand. We are again in one of those prodigious periods of scientific progress in its own way like the pre-Socratic pre period. He said metaphysics would never be the same. For the first time in the history of science, we know how we know, and hence are able to state it clearly. Another of the participants was Joseph Licklider of MIT, a combination of electrical engineer and now psychologist, who was more restrained and said, it is probably dangerous to use this theory of information in fields for which it was not designed, but I think the danger will not keep people from using it. Now I'm gonna recount a little bit of the 1950 conference. Margaret Mead took detailed notes in her personal shorthand, which apparently no one else could read. Jean-Pierre Dupuy, who was almost gonna be here today, has also written extensively about this meeting and, and the others. Claude Shannon was there, and so was Wiener, and also John von Neumann. Ralph Girard, a neuroscientist from the University of Chicago, began by noting that the subject, whatever the, su the subject was exactly, was practically becoming a national fad. He mentioned Time Magazine's new cover story, titled The Thinking Machine, which featured a picture of Wiener. Girard said it was helpful to take lessons from calculating machines and communication systems, but that it was also dangerous. He said, to say, as the public press says, that therefore these machines are brains and that our brains are nothing but calculating machines is presumptuous. One might as well say that the telescope is an eye or that a bulldozer is a muscle. <laughs> 
Wiener's response was, I have not been able to prevent these reports, but I have tried to make the publications exercise restraint. I still do not believe that the use of the word thinking in them is entirely to be reprehended. Then Licklider, the electrical engineer slash psychologist, gave a presentation on quantizing speech and compressing it electronically, and he offered some sample back-of-the-envelope calculations involving phonemes and bandwidth and signal-to-noise ratio, came up with an estimate of 60 bits per second in ordinary human speech. So right now, I'm sending you 60 bits per second. No wonder. <laughs> Wiener interrupted and asked whether anyone had tried a similar calculation for television. Compression for the eye, he said. How much real information is necessary for intelligibility? And then he couldn't resist adding, I often wonder why people try to look at television. Margaret Mead had a different issue to raise. She reminded them that meaning can exist quite apart from phonemes and quite apart from words with dictionary definitions. She asked, if you talk about another kind of information, if you're trying to communicate the fact that somebody is angry, what order of distortion might be introduced to take the anger out of a message that otherwise will carry exactly the same words? Shannon addressed the question of meaning when he made his presentation that evening. Or rather, he announced that he wasn't going to address it. He wasn't going to care about meaning at all. He was just going to talk about information as something transmitted from one point to another. As he said, it might, for example, be a random sequence of digits, or it might be information for a guided missile or a television signal. It might be wrong, or it might be nonsense. In any case, it could be measured. By representing the information source as a statistical process generating messages with varying probabilities. The actual subject of his talk was redundancy in human language, specifically in written English, which he had tried to measure crudely with the help of text in a book he pulled from his own shelf at home. Need needless to say, we can do this kind of work now, and it's a billion times easier. Shannon counted statistics of individual letters and diagrams and trigrams, and then of word groups. He said that English has, in his terminology, a specific entropy, a quantity correlated with redundancy. Now Wiener interrupted again, because his cybernetics theory also used the word entropy. But there was a difference in emphasis. For Wiener, entropy was a measure of disorder. For Shannon, of uncertainty. There are various sorts of order inherent in the text of a real language, order in the form of statistical patterns known consciously or unconsciously to speakers of the language. The more order there is, the more predictability there is. And in Shannon's term, the less information is conveyed by each individual letter or word. If you know what's coming, there's no information. Information is surprise. Now, one may wonder how fully meaning can be removed from this sort of analysis. Certainly, Shannon's listeners wondered. They asked about different languages, different prose styles, ideographic writing, phonemes. One psychologist asked how newspaper writing would look different statistically from the work of James Joyce. A statistician, Leonard Savage, asked how Shannon chose the book for his test. Did he choose it at random? Shannon said he just walked over to the shelf and chose one. Savage said, I wouldn't call that random, would you? There's a danger that the book might be about engineering. Someone else wanted to know if Shannon thought baby talk would be more or less predictable than the speech of an adult. He said, I think more predictable if you are familiar with the baby. <laughs> 
In his original paper, Shannon had taken pains to emphasize that meaning was irrelevant to his conception of information. He gave meaning a careful definition and then dismissed it. Frequently, the messages have meaning. That is, they refer to or are correlated according to some system with certain physical or conceptual entities. These semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. This bothered a lot of people there. Heinz von Furster, a physicist from Vienna who had been a follower of Wittgenstein, said later, I wanted to call the whole of what they called information theory signal theory because information was not yet there. There were beep beeps, but that was all, no information. The moment one transforms that set of signals into other signals, our brains can make an understanding of, then information is born. It's not in the beeps. Now, from the engineering point of view, the mathematical point of view, Shannon was right. Call them beeps or call them bits. All that mathematics works. The proof is in the pudding, which is to say in the edifice of computing and communications that surrounds us, that makes up so much of the modern world. Obviously, it's not quite that simple from the point of view of the social sciences, which we can call the more human sciences, if that's the mood we're in. Information theory did have immediate and strong cross-disciplinary influence. For a while, it was a sort of buzzword, just as cybernetics was a buzzword. It got so faddish that one engineer published a notice complaining about a mythical paper titled Information Theory, Photosynthesis, and Religion. There had, in fact, been papers on information theory, life, and topology, information theory, and the physics of tissue damage, and clerical systems, and psychopharmacology, and geophysical data interpretation, and crystal structure, and melody. The buzz faded away. The social sciences stopped talking explicitly about information theory and cybernetics, but the influence continued. It was not only genuine, but it was profound, and I trace some of that history in, in my book, The Information. I'm not going to say any more about it here. Instead, I want to pivot and ramble just a little bit about this problem of meaning. Maybe the electrical engineers could push it aside, but meaning is surely where the humanities, if they have not reached a dead end, have to take charge. I think it's fair to say that for many people in this room, the mathematical incarnation of information represents a kind of reductionism run wild. Who can love a theory that gives false statements the same value as true statements? Certainly, it is mechanistic practically by definition. For me, the issue becomes a sort of paradox. The point of my book was to tell a story of intellectual history that ends in, or, well, it doesn't end, it leads to the present moment, which everyone seems to agree is particularly fluid, fast-changing, even unstable, the paradox of the present moment is that there's too much information. This is the modern predicament. Too much information is already a cliche with its own acronym for handy texting and tweeting. There's a flood. We have information glut and overload. I don't need to belabor the point. The perfect anticipatory parable for information glut is Borges' Library of Babel where all the information is stored and nothing can be found on the countless shelves, the endless galleries. And Borges seems to have perfectly anticipated the engineer's discarding of meaning. He writes, I know an uncouth region whose librarians repudiate the vain and superstitious custom of finding a meaning in books and equate it with that of finding a meaning in dreams or in the chaotic lines of one's palm. 
An even earlier summary of TMI was this. The multitude of books, the shortness of time, and the slipperiness of memory do not allow all things which are written to be equally retained in the mind. That was written by the Dominican friar Vincent of Beauvais 800 years ago in justifying his life's great project and a combination of encyclopedia and history of the world that is a one-man Wikipedia. Then 50 years ago, in 1962, at yet another meeting of scholars, the president of the American Historical Association, Carl Breidenbaugh, delivered a polemical address warning that human existence was undergoing a, quote, great mutation, so sudden and so radical that we are now suffering something like historical amnesia. He lamented the decline of reading, the distancing from nature, which he blamed in part on ugly yellow Kodak boxes and the transistor radio everywhere, 1962, and generally the loss of shared culture. Most of all, for the historians, the preservers and recorders of the past, he worried about the new tools and techniques available to scholars. That bitch goddess quantification, the data processing machines, as well as those frightening projected scanning devices which we are told will read documents and books for us. And he added, notwithstanding the incessant chatter about communication that we hear daily, it has not improved. Actually, it has become more difficult. I take it that if he were here today, he would not be on Twitter. He might say something like this. Now I'm going, to, I'm going to quote in his absence Jean-Pierre Dupuy. The more we communicate the way we do, the more we create a hellish world. I take hell in its theological sense, i.e. a place which is void of grace, the undeserved, unnecessary, unsurprising, unforeseen. A paradox is at work here. Ours is a world about which we pretend to have more and more information, but which seems to us increasingly devoid of meaning. Well, I think this is a beautiful expression of what's become a popular point of view, that we've arrived in a hellish world devoid of grace, a world of information glut and gluttony, of bent mirrors and counterfeit texts, scurrilous blogs, anonymous bigotry, banal messaging, the false driving out the true. But I think this is wrong. This is not the world I see. However we choose to define knowledge, it seems clear enough that we've got more of it, and we are able to spread it more widely than ever before. I think Carl Breidenbaugh was wrong, too. Some people still worry about historical amnesia, but I think history is more alive than ever and more with us than ever if we care. This TMI sensation, too much information, certainly expresses something about the difficulty of finding the knowledge we want, finding needles in haystacks, distinguishing the true from the false. Yet with all the difficulty, I think our hyper-connected, over-informed age is evolving useful tools and methods. The state of current technology and machine translation makes an interesting case in point. Ten years ago, everyone working in machine translation was thinking systemically in terms of rules, algorithms, structure, logic. Now, as we all know, Google is tackling the problem statistically by churning through tr trillions of words of raw text. It just looks at what people actually say and finds associations between one language and another. And often, the results are complete garbage. And still, they're far better than anything else that artificial intelligence experts have managed to accomplish. Now, it has to be said that Google's translation program is stupid. It embodies no knowledge of what any word actually means. Bananas and carburetors and syllogisms, it's all the same. They're all in the same basket. 
There's also no knowledge of the individual user in this scenario. And all through cyberspace, we're seeing the tension between individual knowledge and collective knowledge. Wikipedia is collective, crowdsourced knowledge at its absolute worst, worst and also at its absolute best. Everyone here knows two things about Wikipedia, that it is utterly unreliable and that it is exceedingly useful. When it's not wrong, it may be plain insipid, yet the breadth and the detail are astounding. You could say the same about just about everything Google does, and you could say the same in a different way about the apparently formless mass of bloggers and Twitterers. Groupthink, that is, gains sway, and yet individuality pokes through. We can accept the mathematical point that information doesn't imply meaning or knowledge or much less wisdom. And meanwhile, we can go on trying to find meaning where we can. I think what I'm trying to say about the state of knowledge in cyberspace is very much in line with what Stephen was just saying about objectivity and subjectivity. The engineer's objective version of information is the one from which meaning has been drained. Epistemologists care about knowledge, not about beeps and signals. No one bothers to construct a philosophy of dots and dashes. The path from signals to knowledge still requires a human or at least, let's say, a cognitive agent if we've reached the post-human era. The conversion of beeps and signals still takes place in the mind. And the standard proverb for that is, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. The source of meaning is surely subjectivity. And if subjectivity is inchoate, unstable, as Stephen says, by definition variable and impossible to pin to the mat, that's just fine. I think the best way to appreciate Google's translation engine and Wikipedia and Twitter and all of the rest is to give up on any dream of perfection. And it seems to me this suits the human sciences just fine. Not only is this a phenomenon that humanities are well positioned to reflect on, to offer perspective and useful context. This is what the humanities are for. The project of organizing knowledge, sorting it, filtering it, reviewing, has been underway for some time now, and yet it's just getting started. We can have infinite possibility, but we can't have certainty. I'd say the engineers have provided an opportunity and a challenge to understand how meaning evolves how life, handling, and coding information progresses to interpretation, belief, and knowledge. Thank you. So these were, I thought, you know, two fascinating papers, um, and I'm sure there's a lot really to be uh, discussed collectively, um, you know, either by members of the audience, uh, former speakers uh, in this conference, or even other people at the table. So I'm going to keep my uh, comments very brief. Also, it's the end of a long day here, um, and, I, and I know there are a lot of ways to kind of get at and, um, and connect these papers, uh, but I just want to kind of focus on one or two uh, points for, uh, for each of them. Uh, and I'll begin with uh, Stephen Chapins. So I thought this was um, a really uh, fascinating, uh, very rich uh, paper, very provocative uh, in a number of ways. And there's lots to be said, of course, about uh, many of the issues that, that you raise, um, you know, whether about the problem of aesthetics and uh, the knowing subject, uh, or about the nature of a reasoned deliberation versus a sentimental judgment. Um, and in fact, this, this last point actually also uh, interested me quite a lot, namely the relationship between sentiment and taste, um, especially as 
uh, Hume himself in his discussion on the um, you know, delicacy of taste and passion, uh, and it also comes up, I think, in, in his treatise uh, of human nature, um, especially as Hume himself kind of connects the two, sentiment and taste. Um, and in fact, what he argues there is that the delicacy of passion, so someone who, for instance, feels the pains and pleasures of life more acutely uh, than other people, uh, is uh, really um, uh, kind of better channeled into refined taste. So he sees sentiment and taste as you know, kind of fundamentally connected, uh, which of course makes sense with uh, Hume's general ideas on sentiment uh, and association of ideas and kind of uh, his views on reason generally. Um, but, I, but I wanted to go you know, to an, another question kind of altogether, um, and, and maybe to kind of go back to the uh, subjectivity, uh, objectivity divide uh, that you raised at the start. Um, and I found this section where you uh, discussed the, these ideas, uh, notions of a kind of sociology of attention, uh, really fascinating. Uh, and particularly the suggestion that uh, uh, connoisseur tasters, uh, you could call them expert tasters or delicate tasters in uh, Hume's language, uh, attempt to kind of sense things, um, you know, sensation through taste or, or sense uh, uh, with such attention that, uh, or with such focus or discernment that, uh, and I'm, I'm quoting uh, you, quoting uh, Antoine Henio's work here, uh, that they might quote, uh, induce a stronger presence of the object. And I, I found that really uh, interesting to kind of think through uh, in terms of thinking about the subject to be uh, objectivity divide. Uh, but also, um, uh, really, in essence, another classic 18th century poem that I think is embedded in your work here, uh, which is really the, the connection between our perception or understanding of the world and the world itself, right? So the problem of uh, ontology, I guess. Um, and it seems that that relationship is exactly what's at stake for both, um, you know, connoisseur tasters uh, and exactly what uh, really uh, they engage in uh, intersubjectively as well. Uh, and it's uh, uh, exactly what uh, scientists do in the, in the kind of uh, analogy that you raised. Now it's working. Okay, so I've been uh, shouting here and I can calm down. Um, so, um, so I guess in a sense, you know, I think your, your paper really kind of helped destabilize a number of kind of a trenchant kind of enlightenment dichotomies, subjectivity, objectivity, uh, reason, sentiment, truth, beauty. Uh, and it seems that there's also uh, this question of uh, self-other, right, in terms of that ability to uh, somehow uh, kind of have a, a certain discernment, uh, a certain approach to objects, to objectness, uh, that can actually change uh, our very understanding of what uh, comprises the self or what comprises subjectivity. Okay. Um, now, James Glick's paper also raised uh, a host of fascinating issues. Uh, about the nature of, of meaning versus information, uh, and about the role of um, you know the subjective, discerning, uh, or cognitive agent that's kind of hidden in machine technologies uh, through uh, a purely uh, uh, information uh, theory of uh, how we communicate or communication in general. Um, and I, I liked very much your treatment of um, information uh, theorists' attempt to kind of construct a, a theory of, of information. Uh, as kind of communicative signals or beeps of some kind um, uh, that paid no attention to meaning. I like the fact that you're drawing attention to uh, the way in which they're attempting uh, uh, to elide meaning uh, there uh, and the problems with that. Um, and of course, in the, in the kind of historical context uh, that uh, you know, forms the, the rise of information theory, that makes sense. Um, Shannon, after all, was trying to relate a mathematical a code, uh, tried to construct, sorry, a mathematical code that might help uh, break uh, or decrypt uh, coded messages. So uh, in the context of, say, cryptology, trying to wrestle meaning from messages uh, whose meaning has been deliberately obscured uh, makes sense. So trying to uh, construct uh, a theory where you could uh, understand information uh, and think about how to draw meaning out uh, where meaning has been deliberately obscured, uh, then I think uh, the story that you tell uh, is kind of interesting in that context. Um, and it works in the other cases that you, you mentioned briefly, uh, you know, genetic uh, coding, uh, molecular biology, uh, indeed even machine translation, those cases where uh, meaning is assumed to be obscure, where we, we assume we don't share a communicative language. Uh, so thinking about how you can construct uh, a mathematical code of information in that context 
uh, I think, uh, again, makes sense. But um, when you brought in references to uh, you know, Wikipedia or Twitter, uh, for instance, at the end, I got, I got a little confused there, I have to say. Um, because I, I wondered you know, how you might sort of connect your story, uh, you know, this tension between, say, information and meaning, uh, more specifically to, uh, to kind of computer uh, networks, uh, you know, things like the World Wide Web, the Internet, uh, or, or even sort of uh, Ted Nelson's kind of never realized, you know, Project Xanadu, uh, which um, sees those computer technologies, sees that information revolution as uh, having the potential uh, to really uh, make meaning in radically new ways, what he calls sort of hypertext, that you can read text uh, linearly, make uh, connect no, non-linearly, uh, in a non-linear way, sorry, uh, so you can make connections between texts. It's sort of, uh, he makes the analogy that this is really what uh, kind of literature does uh, in general, you know, when you have marginalia uh, or footnotes, that would be an example of that. But computer technologies, uh, computer networks, allow us to do that at a greater scale. Uh, and so they uh, create the new potential uh, for meaning in that context. So I guess I was kind of curious, you know, what, whether or not you thought the sort of information compression and coding that goes into, uh, you know, uh, constructing, uh, uh, you know, uh, computer interfaces is really the same thing as the way in which people engage with those as technologies. Um, so that's it. And then responses. Well, but then let me try see if I can respond directly to what you just asked. Um, I'll, I'll respond as simply as I can. First of all, there's a whole line of, that I didn't even mention, much less get into, that a, a whole line of dissent from Shannon's mathematical information theory that's extremely powerful, that the meaning-free formalism I mean really meaning fr free, he was adamant, had tremendous consequences ap totally apart from the ones that I was describing in the social sciences that uh, led directly to um, an understanding of the nature of randomness that comes from the, the relatively new mathematics of algorithmic information theory. It's had a tremendous influence on modern physics. I imagine there are people in this room who, who could tell us more about what, what's being done these days in quantum information science. And in all of these sciences, the idea of information as a meaningless abstraction uh, holds sway. I mean, it's, this is, if, if any of us still want to believe in such a thing as objective science after listening to uh, Stephen, then this is one of them. On the other hand, I certainly agree with you that the way we as humans live in the world that these technologies have handed us is full of meaning. That's the, that's the whole point. We are humans and we like to communicate. And, and it's interesting, just as a, an aside, how many times today we've heard about Ted Nelson and hypertext. Because I, on, in one way, that project was a sort of dead end. That is, a lot of people very Briefly, there was a flurry of activity of people who thought that new literature was going to emerge in the form of hypertext, and I'm not seeing that. On the other hand, the entire project of the World Wide Web is a, an expression of hypertext, and as, as I think you're suggesting, is full of new kinds of human interaction that surely give rise to meaning. But Jim, I, th I think Marwa's um, sort of excellent question to you is whether there's some uh, disambiguation that's needed here because you know you started off by talking about the the pure signaling elements uh, which can be mathematically pursued you know uh, uh, mathematically elaborated and, uh, and studied see so take for example a, an absolutely uh, sort of paradigmatic way of thinking about signaling and so on, uh, and information in that sense, is that the, the, the lines around the tree of a bark carry information about the tree's age, right? That's, they literally carry information in the sense of the kinds of encodings and so on that you were saying lack human, uh, the human element of subjectivity, etc. But then when you went on to talk about the sorts of things that that you did when you talked about too much information and so on, uh, 
you in a sense changed your own subject. You were talking about information in a completely different sense. And I think that's what Marwa was, was saying, that somehow in the middle of your paper, the subject became a different subject. You mean you think I was going back to the colloquial, the colloquial, colloquial everyday meaning of information that the engineers that's were right. trying to get rid of? That, that the engineers were trying to get rid of, and yet it seemed as there was a seamless single notion of, of information, and I think Marwa was wanting you to, well, to that's disambiguate. A, uh, that's, a, that's a fair point, I, but I'm not sure I want to disambiguate. Um, I'm, I want to argue that there is a connection between the problem that arises, the problem that we could see sociologically on the minds of the social scientists at those cybernetics meetings who were horrified by the idea that you would try, you would try to uh, make something productive out of a notion of information devoid of meaning. I believe there is an analogy between, more than an analogy, a, a direct line from that discomfort to the discomfort that we feel in the modern age that Jean-Pierre Dupuy was expressing in the passage I was reading, where he says that uh, we are surrounded by information and it is devoid of meaning, and it, and it lands us in a world that is hellish because it is devoid of grace. I, I think that they're, the discomfort of the social scienti scientists 60 years ago and the discomfort that we feel if we feel that there is too much information and not enough knowledge and wisdom, uh, th those are exactly the same thing. And yes, to express these, there's no avoiding the fact that you have to use information in different senses. And um, a point that has been made about my book is that I nowhere actually attempt to define information. I confess that that's true, and uh, and I, I I only can refer people to the Oxford English Dictionary, which continues to update its definition of the word information. And I, the last time I looked, it, the definition uh, ran eighty thousand words. Steve. Well, I, I I don't know that I have anything very clever to say. I've been trying very hard to think of a connection between what uh, James was saying and, and I was. And it, it might consist in something like this, so if you don't mind me trying it on. Um, subject to correction, I think uh, James was saying that um, knowledge is information plus point, purpose, co uh, context. Very much as Max Weber was suggesting that action is behavior plus point, purpose, and context is famous example of the, the woodcutter of behavior is this, woodcutting is that, and another <coughs> level, that is working out rage or getting in fuel for the winter. In the um, philosophical, physiological, and commercial treatment of uh, perception, I think you get something vaguely similar to that. One of the disagreements that Edmund Burke has with David Hume. Hume says, what's bitter to me is sweet to you, what's sweet to me is bitter to you, and Burke says no. And it's something like a reestat. At that point, it's a recurrent move in uh, the philosophy of, of sense perception. You can either treat uh, what an individual senses as a report of what the individual senses, or you can say no what uh, the report is already enculturated, the report is already some organized, evaluated, sentiment-laden process of whatever it is impinges on the rather or the olfactory membranes. In the philosophical tradition, I don't think this is ever made clear. Um, in the, the when, I, when I ended, not, not, not facetiously talking about the objectification of the, the private sensory world by Pillsbury, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's, they don't care. Because what's relevant to them in the world of action, in the world of buying things or not buying things, is people's reports on whether they like something, people's activity in buying another of those things uh, or not. Uh, they are, as it were, they have bracketed the question of sense, sensory action uh, 
I think, pr pr proximal to reports on sensory action or action in accordance with, with sense experience. So there, there are ways of thinking about that philosophical move, that philosophical uh, predicament that look at it as a set of institutionalized uh, practices in, in, in our lives. <coughs> um, I think in the, in the uh, positivist philosophical uh, tradition, uh, sense data was, was treated as reports of, of sense. Um, there's, there's no, no necessity in, in, in doing that. I mean, for for this for the sociological move that I want to make, in other words, the move towards intersubjectivity, which unites uh, the world of taste and the world uh, of science judgments, that's where they meet. So it's not simply say I like Regoletto and I don't like Ghetto Demeron, but I can proceed to, as it were, point, draw your attention to uh, a. a a world which is available to be sensed by you, and a world of evaluation which I make available to be shared by you, or you make available to share by shared by me, and that's why I want to say something like um, uh, the subjective is indeed private, uh, but not entirely so, and the objective is indeed public or universal, but not entirely so, and that's why I don't like the wax and seal. We're stuck with the categories that we use to sort and evaluate different forms of cultural practice. Uh, but we're better off regarding, uh, I don't, I'm not a great fan of finding a new language, but we can continue to use the language, but understand both of these as hybrid modes. That's, I, that's what I'm trying to I say. I think this is a, re a really important point that you're making. The, the idea that, um, that you can say to another person, this Vermeer painting is beautiful, and now I'm going to tell you why it's beautiful. And and we, and people do that. I mean, I took a course in college where I was paying the professor to explain to me why it was beautiful, and and I can accept the knowledge that I am gaining from him without, as you say, believing that there has to be some kind of perfect universal theory of aesthetics. Exactly. In the same way, you can say this prelude by Bach is beautiful. You can say it to somebody who doesn't particularly like it, and then you can try to explain why it's beautiful, but I think you would also feel, I think everybody in this room would feel that if you could ever prove it, if you could ever get to the end, if you could f provide a complete explanation of a short Bach prelude, why it really works, everything about it that worked, it actually wouldn't be any good. Exactly. That's exactly. That's I think you, you know, sorry, you, know, you said uh, give up on perfection. I think of, I would say give up on the rose garden view of either objectivity or of, of subjectivity, and just look at the English garden as <laughs> as it is. Uh, okay. So let's get some questions. There's there's Srinivas and then Stathis and then another one. Um, thank you. This is a, um, a question for Professor Shapin. Um, I really enjoyed your talk, and I was uh, keen to ask you a little bit more about the way in which you were trying to locate the question of the sciences of subjectivity as a somewhat different set of questions when it moves away from the standard focus on objectivity to that of intersubjectivity. However, um, if you don't mind my saying so, I, I, I was, I, I, th I thought it was a compelling paper, but the examples, um, you know, which I enjoyed, but, you know, opera, wine, um, I guess, um, cannabis, I mean, they were, they were fairly um, hackneyed in the sense that they stayed within the realm of the trivially aesthetic where people agree to disagree and no one's life is destroyed. Um, I guess what I wanted to push you a little bit more on was how the question of judgment in that particular way, in precisely in the way that you defined it, is where several theorists have really indeed raised the stakes, for instance, uh, Jacques Rancière, in the sense that the, the political realm is precisely one that is founded on that very set of parameters that you were defining. 
in that the objective is extremely close to the intersubjective. Um, this is even when in the small case, as we are largely in an academic setting, um, say a, a tenure decision in a department where say the fate of one individual hangs in the balance and there are a bunch of extremely talented scholars who might disagree vehemently about the value and the status of the work. Or much bigger questions such as a national election where the fate of a country hangs in the balance. And yet the mechanisms of the political, of the sphere of the political, are uh, I think very much along the lines, or at least could be seen as very much along the lines of the things that you were indeed describing. So it's not just wine or opera, much though I love wine and I'd, I'd love to talk about that, but isn't there something potentially much bigger at stake in what you've uncovered? And I'd like you to, to address that. I think you've answered the, the question very well. I, I had only, you're, you're right about that, although I would insist that um, the aesthetic industrial complex is very big, very consequential, mm -hmm. and uh, very little attended to in our society. But I did a throwaway line on pretzels and presidents I don't disagree with anything you said. I mean, offering, as it were, uh, a narrative of sentiment, even quite frankly called a, an aesthetic narrative about a program of political action or a political candidate. I mean, we have been watching Mad Men, haven't we? Um, it's very much what's happening. I, I didn't pick those examples. I tended, I suppose the examples I picked were partly selected uh, because I like to get the conversation going by making the soft seem hard and the trivial seem consequential. Uh, but I wouldn't disagree with anything that you've said. It's, uh, if any, so I suppose it's a failure of my rhetorical preferences, but nothing more than that. Start uh, this. Yeah, James, I was really struck by the comment that one of the people in the conference, and I can't remember which one the name now said, that we are like in the pre-Socratic uh, analogy to the pre-Socratic um, uh, years, years of pre-Socratic philosophy. Not so much for the reasons given uh, by this person, but because if we are going to generalize it all about pre-Socratic philosophy, which actually we can't, but if we were, um, we would say that it establishes a, uh, an epistemological context where uh, meaning emerges out of non-meaning uh, uh, or being emerges out of non-being as well without abolishing the existence uh, of non-meaning, non-being. And um, in thinking in those terms, one would, one, I, I would go on to say that, um, that meaning is always a certain kind of imputation onto the meaninglessness, onto a certain sphere of meaninglessness. Um, without ever exhausting that sphere and without ever abolishing that sphere. And I would go even further to say that the uh, radical, uh, m um, how did you call it, form form f meaningless formalism of uh, someone like Shannon is in some ways an imputation of meaning. It is, a, a, in fact, a signification um, of a certain kind that enables it, in fact, to become used as you said, and it is true in various other systems. Um, so um, the question of, of meaning then is not really a matter of, uh, uh, I mean, the question of meaning, it, it really leads us back to the issue of the cognitive agent or, or, or the human and so on. The, if meaningless may be said to exist some sort of strange, um, what we could say, impersonal, uh, fashion, uh, it, uh, it, it, it is always signified by whoever uh, organizes it. And even if whoever organizes it organizes a, a, a kind of meaninglessness. This is what the uh, information theory mathematically is supposed to do. It's not just a matter of uh, uh, philosophically or sociologically creating meaning uh, that uh, builds communities and so on and so forth. This is even meaninglessness in that sense. Make. This set starts to sound rather meta to me. <laughs> In, but for, and I mean that very specifically. That 
that uh, if you try to impute a sort of meaning to Shannon's meaninglessness or to the meaninglessness that one imagines he, he is talking about, the meaning you are imputing is existing on another level. It's outside of the system because um, it's quite, there's a very specific way in which he is saying meaning is not relevant to the engineers. Meaning is irrelevant to the engineering problem. This is, you can deny this as if you're a philosopher, but you cannot deny this if you're a mathematician or an, or an engineer. That's my view of it. Now, I could justify that, but I think it, it might get boring. <laughs> yes. I uh, have a comment for Jim Glick and a question for Steve. So in, um, in my book, How We Became Post-Human, I have a chapter on the Macy Conferences. And one of the points that I try to make in that chapter is that part of what was at stake in Shannon's formulation of information theory was a decontextualization of information so that it became independent of the substrate. And it essentially was defined as a probability function. And I contrast that with Donald McKay's embodied notion of information, kind of a rival theory about the same time, where uh, McKay was interested in defining information as its impact, of, as the change it brought about in the receiver. And of course, the problem is, as soon as you contextualize information in the way McKay was trying to do, the quantitative problems become uh, massive. So to my mind, this was one of those interesting examples in science studies where the less rich theory wins out, precisely because it makes those simplifying assumptions that make it quantitatively um, tractable. Yeah, it's less rich for you. It's less rich for the social scientists at the Macy conferences who, whose feathers were ruffled, but it's not less rich to the mathematicians. You know, let's give credit to their, to their way of seeing things too and, and recognize how truly powerful that formulation was. I mean, it worked. As I, as I said, the proof is in the pudding. You, can't, you would not have that phone in your pocket today if, uh, if Shannon hadn't treated information in the admittedly desiccated way that he did. Well, I absolutely agree that it was powerful. But one of the spin-off effects of that was to generate the idea that uh, the human brain is nothing but an information pattern. Uh, and that was possible because information was decontextualized and disembodied in Shannon's theory. So I think all credit is due to Shannon. But the way that Shannon's theory was used by subsequent generations, I, I, to my mind, was very problematic. Uh, in its application of a disembodied theory to an embodied creature such as uh, the human brain. And that kind of brings me to the question I wanted to ask Steve. So I wondered uh, where in your discussion of subjectivity you would locate the cognitive unconscious and uh, to what extent objectivity assumes consciousness and reason and subjectivity uh, is maybe a more encompassing term that would include Polanyi's tacit knowledge, but now in you know, more contemporary terms would include the cognitive unconscious. And you were talking about intersubjective processes of kind of equilibrating. Yeah. So I wondered what, in, in what way you might incorporate the cognitive unconscious into your, uh, into your ideas about subjectivity. I'm going to use the word unconscious since the last time I passed out. <laughs> um, I would really like to answer the other point. Maybe, maybe, uh, seriously, maybe we can get around to some sort of interesting response to your, uh, your question. Um, and that is, I'd like to, um, to think of this lowering the tone level of uh, contextualizing aesthetic response or decontextualizing aesthetic response. We have a spectacular example, perhaps the most influential wine writer, wine critic today, a man called Robert Parker that you'll 
many of you will know about, has been criticized, uh, perhaps rightly, for decontextualizing the aesthetic response. It's not just the numbers that he assigns wines are good if they're over 90, not so good if they're in the 80s. But he also developed, and I, I think he developed this out of a UC Davis practice, of uh, moving away from all this evocative aesthetic like a spring morning, burgundy's like a woman, that sort of thing, to a uh, language of uh, things like peach kernels, uh, tomato skin, wet stones, and roasted lilacs, <laughs> which are ultimately vouched for in the UC Davis <laughs> scheme of things by the view uh, or faith that there are chemicals found in these substances which are also found in the wines that are causally responsible for the odors and that you can uh, get an aesthetic response by summing up these analytic uh, categories. Now, Parker's uh, approaches has been criticized as, as decontextualizing because when you drink wine in natural occurring settings, you're drinking against the background of expectations because you see the label, red and, and white, with friends in a nice vineyard on a summer's day, on a winter's day, with food, etc. In other words, a naturally occurring context. To which Parker has replied, I think, very powerfully, because he sees himself as the Ralph Nader of the aesthetic world, and said, decontextualization is precisely what you want. You want to know what's in the glass, what is in the glass, all that context stuff you can do for yourself. And if you think that's a mad response, I think school is an institution of decontextualization. Because when you're told about Jill has three apples and John has two apples, forget John and Jill, forget apples. This is not about buying apples. It's a stupid student who's going to get a, an F on his or her test that says, well, I have to know about Jill and John. The, the purpose of school is to decontextualize a set of skills so that can be deployed, we hope and think, in real context. And I think Parker is saying, this is what an uh, uh, aesthetic response uh, it may be contextual, but in order for it to become useful to the whole range of mm -hmm. contexts in which we do respond to Vermeers or operas or, or glasses of wine, we want the decontextualized bit, we want the informational bit. But, yeah. so can I just ask a question about this? Suppose we look at paintings, I'm not sure what to say about wine. I wonder if sometimes the context is actually dictated by pro other properties of the painting rather yes. than the ambient surround. Yes. Right. So, so for instance, if somebody says, I like this painting because of some property in the painting, he may not want to say that another painting which has that property is something that he has the same favorable response to, which, because it's embedded in other properties of the painting, which are very different. So the context needn't sure. be just the ambient context, but the context in the object. Sure. The con uh, the co I mean, context is, uh, it doesn't mean right. stuff from the outside. Right. It means from textile, things running through uh, the, the thing. But I mean, but our naturally occurring aesthetic responses, sadly or not sadly, uh, involve things like the, the, f the reputation and price of the painting. And if you go into the Met, and you'll see everyone wants to see the Botticelli in the Renaissance Portraits exhibit, go around the corner, and there's no one there. It's exponential. So it's part of our naturally occurring aesthetic response. I think David Hume knew about this, although David Hume, as Mara pointed out, did re refer to delicacy of, of taste, and he didn't mean it. Bria Stavrand certainly meant it when he talked about papillae, taste, taste buds. He also referred to masters of taste, which are like the, uh, uh, James's teacher, who can be re reliably assumed of vast experience with that sort of thing. Uh, and have integrity in delivering their judgments, and Hume added, aren't bores in insisting that they must be right. Those are the people to look for. And you need to look for these people, and we do look for So a naturally occurring theory of face is contextualized, but one shouldn't simply dismiss the point or purpose of a decontextualized uh, approach to naturally occurring aesthetic responses. But do you That's school. Do you think one can extend Parker's decontextualizations to, to when the context is determined by the object itself and other properties? He wants to say the context is determined by the object itself. Me, I am a master of taste. In other words, I'm a man of integrity. He, he ticks the Humean boxes. I've drunk a lot of these things. I'm a man of integrity. I buy my own wine. 
I don't even, I sit in a cold hotel room in Bordeaux and don't go to the Chateau Margaux. Uh, it's strictly what is in the glass. In other words, but he's, you know, he should be part of this conversation. He says, there's no such thing, Robert Parker, as wine objectivity. It's your taste that, that matters. But what he is doing, uh, I would argue, in fact, I don't like his, his taste, uh, shows the point and purpose of decontextualization of a naturally occurring, naturally occurring contextualized response. And I don't think that's a crazy thing to do. Yes. A last question here. I'd like to make uh, two, two comments, one about levels and one about meaning. And the levels, okay, and, uh, if, if you're a programmer, you're dealing with a computer system to create something, you're dealing with nine different levels that are stacked up like railroad uh, bridges uh, with nine decks. Okay, at the bottom is Shannon's. There's a, how do you get the bits across? And then the next level above will have its own rules and you keep going until you get to the software rules where you, you've dealt, uh, you created a, a little world of your own through your software programs and these are data structures and they may resemble things like the constituents in linguistics. So they're, they're very different sorts of creatures than, than Shannon's. Shannon started it and he took the lowest level which was uh, dealing mainly with communication. But the art of, uh, uh, you know, con conveying things across a, that, that you want to from one place to another that the, that the, the program has developed in a process is done uh, in current kinds of systems in this stacked way where each one makes its contribution and it happens in parallel and things can go wrong in any one of them. If they all work all together then, then it's you know, relatively successful. That's levels. Um, in terms of meaning, Meaning has been uh, dealt with statistically by Gustav Herdan, who was uh, originally a quantum science, you know, quantum uh, st uh, statistics uh, expert in the 20s and 30s, and then he got into his pissed about <coughs> uh, epidemiology and from there linguistics in 40s, 50s, and 60s. And he said, you can't use um, independent based independence assuming statistics because they automatically take out the meaning. I mean, they can't, you can't have, meaning has to do with relationships between things. So he says you can do letters statistics with independence, but for, if you're going to deal with words, you have to use other kinds of quantum mechanic things like, uh, 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 you know, Bose, Einstein, or Fermi, Dirac, then they each have their application. And then he goes on to prove that they predict better than the uh, Maxwell Boltzmann uh, independence assuming ones. So meaning can be dealt with, but you have to use the right mathematical methods. And that, that was developed before Shannon, really, those ideas. And I think it's just a scent from the, the Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, please let's thank our speakers.